Good morning. It's a blessing to open God's Word with you this morning. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me back to the book of 1 Corinthians. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. As you're turning there, uh, I've shared before, I, 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 I have a number of books in my office that are about the, the meaning of words, the use of words, the origins of words, and one of that I particularly enjoyed a few years ago was uh, called Why Do We Say It? And, and it was the really origin of a lot of idioms and phrases that we have, and uh, looking through it, it was, it was organized alphabetically. I actually came across one this week that, that wasn't from that book. It was from another source. It was the phrase, turn a blind eye. Uh, according to legend, Lord Nelson, the, the hero of the Battle of Trafalgar in the British Navy in the Napoleonic era, had uh, an eye in battle prior to a particular engagement where his commander actually was signaling for him to withdraw. And turning to one of his shipmates, he said, I, I think I'm going to say quite honestly, I don't see it. Then he held his telescope up to where his eye had formerly been and said, I can say with all truthfulness, I didn't see the order. I didn't see the signal. And from that arose the phrase to turn a blind eye. Now, things like that, sense of words and phrases and little things that we do, so often we just, we use them. We go through the use of them without ever really thinking about why. Why do we do it that way? There's a story, maybe you've heard of it, uh, of a church in some part of Europe, I think it was Great Britain, that after the time of Roman Catholicism, the chapel that had been uh, formerly used as a Roman Catholic church, they had taken all the icons, all the images and statues out. But the people, in rejection of that, still when they came in, would turn to where the statue formerly had been, and they would bow themselves just a little bit before heading in. Well, as generations passed, the people, as they had for years and generations, even though they didn't even remember what used to be there, would come and turn and do a little bow towards that corner and continue on. And after some time, uh, another uh, pastor was assigned to that particular church and began to ask the congregation, why is it that when, when you all walk through the door, you, you do that little movement? And no one knew why. And as he began to dig through the records and, and, and look back on the history of that particular church, he, he realized that was why. The generation succeeding that had no allegiance to that icon, had no allegiance to that practice, but they had, through their long years of just rote doing, become accustomed to, I come in, I go through this mission, and I continue on without really ever considering, why am I doing it? Tragically, I'm afraid that's more often the case than we would maybe even care to notice. Coming out of the book of Jonah, and so much of our focus has been on repentance. It's been on the fight against our sin. And today we're going to be considering, and really over the next several weeks, just how serious it is that we're in a fight, and what the Lord has provided for us for that fight, that fight for holiness. Even this past Wednesday, as we looked at the subject of worship, and last Lord's Day, as we looked at worship as one of the most appropriate responses to God's people to the resurrection, we recognize that we have to be actively engaged in fighting sin and laboring in the pursuit of holiness. And our God isn't silent about this. He's ordained means by which we can and ought to pursue holiness. He's given us all the tools we need for it. Coming out of the resurrection weekend, when there's such a distinct focus on the death and resurrection of our Lord, where we've been reminded to remember, to think well and deeply on our Savior slain for us, and coming to the first Sunday of the month where we, for our normal practice here at Community, in the evening service where we have a family night of worship, this morning we're going to be considering the gift of the Lord's Supper. And specifically, we're going to be considering how the Lord's table plays a part in our pursuit of holiness. Have you ever thought that way? Have you ever thought about the Lord's Supper as one of the tools in your arsenal for the fight against sin and in your fight for Christ's likeness? like the folks in our story this morning who would go into the chapel and nod towards the corner and continue on. I'm afraid so often we can go through the motions without really considering well the meaning. This isn't a new concept for believers, by the way. The idea that the Lord's table is meant for that. One of the great Puritans, Thomas Watson, said, this ordinance, the Lord's Supper, 
when partaken of in faith has glorious effects on the hearts of God's children. It quickens their affection, strengthens their faith, mortifies their sins, revives their hopes, increases their joy, and gives a rich foretaste of heaven. Do we have that kind of thorough partaking of the Lord's Supper? Do we approach the Lord's table anticipating that it will do us good? That it will quicken or enliven our affections, strengthen our faith, mortify sin, revive our hope, increase joy, and give a foretaste of heaven? Or do we just look at it as, yeah, we do that thing? It's meaningful, it's, it's nice, and it's, it's a wonderful time that we have, but do we, do we take it to the fullest extent that God has provided it for us to enjoy and use? The Dutch theologian said Christ instituted the supper as a permanent good for his church. Calvin, writing on the text we're in this morning, said the sacraments have a tendency to exercise us in holiness and love. They are a help to our weaknesses. Beloved, that, that's what it's meant to do. It's a good gift from our Heavenly Father commanded by him for our benefit. And we observe it not out of some ritualistic duty or dead ceremony or a drudgery of tradition. We observe it to feed our soul, strengthen our faith, and rejoice in our Lord and Savior's word and work. And I use those phrases in particular. In the 1689 Baptist Confession, it says about those who would partake of the Lord's Supper, that in doing so they would examine themselves their knowledge to discern the Lord's body of their faith to feed upon him of their repentance, love, and new obedience. That's the goal. That's the big idea for this morning is feed upon the table of the Lord. Far too often I'm afraid there's plenty of things that we can engage in as believers. We can either miss out on the full blessing of because of our lackluster approach to it or we can be so practiced of it that we fail to receive the goodness in it. As we looked at worship this past Wednesday night, all of life is meant to be done in worship. And we do that so poorly because we fail to see it that way. Even our singing, we, we've been talking a lot about singing praises to our God. When we do them without heart, without thought, without vigor, we're missing the encouragement and the goodness that the Lord has designed those to bestow on those who practice them as he has commanded. His word tells us it is good to sing praises to our God. We encourage one another with the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That means that we're supposed to receive benefit from what God has commanded us to do. And what a gracious thing that our Lord would not only ordain that we receive blessing from these things, but that they're enjoyable as well. And this is always how it works. Obedience brings blessing. Even in what seems a sacrifice in the moment, the forsaking of homes, houses, lands, friends, and family for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, it becomes the means by which we can expect to receive many times as much. That's what our Lord said in Matthew 19, 29, Luke 18, 30. Jesus goes even further than that when in the Sermon on the Mount he tells us that when we're persecuted, how should we regard ourselves? As blessed. What the Lord commands and commissions for his people, no matter how it circumstantially appears, is for our good. It's threaded through with blessing and will bring him glory. And that's a hard lesson to learn, but it's a good one. So when we come to the specific commands of our Lord, like how we ought to conduct ourselves among other believers and the way in which we're to remember him through the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, it's not just some weird ceremony. It's not some mystical hoodoo tradition that we carry out by rote. Instead, it's meant to minister to us. As I mentioned, the 1689 Confession says in its introduction to the Lord's Supper that the Supper of the Lord Jesus was instituted by him to be observed in his churches for the perpetual remembrance of himself and his death, for the confirmation of the faith of believers and all the benefits thereof, and their spiritual nourishment and growth in him. Sorry to mention our big ideas that we're to be fed by the Lord's table. 
Lord, receive nourishment, sustenance, strength from this ordinance given to us by the gracious hand of our God. We're to be fed by the Lord's table. And we can recognize too, we need to recognize too, that it can be done badly. To participate in the Lord's Supper, as scripture will term it, in an unworthy manner, or to do so improperly is dangerous, even deadly dangerous. And we'll see that in our text. Here in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul's already been answering a number of questions posed by the church and correcting the numerous struggles and errors that were taking place. Corinth had first received the gospel through the ministry of the Apostle Paul some, some years before this, in around AD 50. And after spending almost two years there, Paul continued on his missionary labor to other regions. And it's from these other re regions, probably Ephesus, that Paul is writing back to the church at Corinth. As we get to verse 17 of chapter 11, we're going to see that Paul isn't answering any question about the Lord's table at this point. But instead, he's responding to things he's heard are taking place in the church's gathering. And Paul here is going to roundly rebuke the Corinthians for how off track they've gotten in their gatherings, particularly in regard to the observance of the Lord's table. We begin reading here in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. But in giving this instruction, what he's just been dealing with, what he's about to give us, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. From the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in your eating, each one of you takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you. This gives us a picture of what was going wrong and, and some of why. What, did you, what happened... <laughs> What had happened that, that would put Paul in the place where he's speechless? I, I want you to think about that for just a second. That's essentially what he just said in verse 22. What shall I say to you? This is the man who has an 11 verse sentence in Ephesians 1. And he's just said, I, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> that's, that's his condition at the, the, the state of the church in Corinth in regard to this particular ordinance. In the ancient world, there were a variety of cultural feasts and meals and festivals, both for the Jews and the Gentiles. In Corinth, where <coughs> there was a wide variety of people from Jewish and Gentile cultural backgrounds, across a wide swath of spiritual backgrounds, they had Egyptian temples and Greek temples and all sorts of spiritual worship that was taking place in Corinth, most of which had some kind of festival or meal associated with it. There's economic stratas across the board in this place. And the people that are coming to the, the, the Lord here, they all have their own sin bins. And even just societal norms, all of this had clashed and produced this despicable situation in the church gathering. The various gatherings and meals and things that culturally, societally, spiritually, they were, pun intended, bringing to the table were often just vehicles for self-promotion. They were often very elaborate and used to distinguish class and favor from one person to another. And we see that across the pages of Scripture. We see that there was a practice in the way that the, Jesus rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees and when he told them, uh, as uh, he described them as loving the chief seats in the synagogue and places of honor at banquets. We know from what we already had uh, read for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 by Brother Larry, there was already division existing in the church of Corinth over what to eat, much less in the Jewish practices of who is to eat with who. There were a regular struggle in the source of division in the early church. We see that in places like Galatians 2 and Acts 11, where there were those who, from their Jewish background, were saying, I, I don't know, am, am, I, am I supposed to have a meal with these Gentiles? In fact, think back, Acts chapter 11 is when Peter is called to account to the rest of the leaders of the church at Jerusalem. Some years before this, we, we heard you were, you were eating with Gentiles, Peter? This was not an uncommon struggle that there would be this sort of division and strife around gatherings. In the Greek culture at that time, they would have even had different 
tiered or leveled tables for their gatherings. The lower tables for the poor, the higher tables for the wealthy and well-regarded. And this cultural practice had spilled over into the meals that often accompanied the observance of the Lord's table in the early church. But rather than that being a blessing, hey, we're going to gather and we're going to have a fellowship. We're going to eat and then we're going to take the Lord's table. Instead of this being a unifying event in the life of the church gathering, sinful practices had twisted and perverted them into a divisive, drunken scene of disarray that dishonored the Lord that they were supposed to be remembering. I want you to imagine what that would look like in our own fellowship. Hey, we're going to have dinner on the grounds after this, but you know, based on your income level is where you're going to sit and whether or not you get to get in line and win. Imagine how divisive and destructive that would be to a gathering. Again, I think sometimes we can sort of remove ourselves of, man, they're just so different back then, the times of the New Testament, the times of Scripture. Let's, let's try to impose some of what they were practicing on today and see how that goes. This would still be destructive to the people of the Lord. This was sowing great division, born out of self-promotion, and self-absorbed practices by some, mainly the wealthy, and the shaming and neglect of others, mainly the poor. And one of the reasons this is such a big deal is seen clearly in verse 17. Paul says these gatherings, which should be for the better, are actually for the worse. Rather than this accomplishing the good work of unifying, something that Paul touches on extensively in chapter 10, what we just had read to us a few moments ago, that this partaking of the elements are a unifying force for the body of Christ. These gatherings were causing the church to be divided. Divisions, factions, Paul says, they're inevitable, but not this way, not because of these sinful practices. Another reason of why this is such a big deal is because of what Paul says in verse 20. When you meet together, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. In other words, that may have been what they were doing in name, but in practice, this supper is not the Lord's. This supper was all about them and their sinful desires. Brothers and sisters, do we realize how much unity matters to our Lord? And what is it that unifies believers? We're just told a page or so before this in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. Ephesians makes this beautifully clear as it addresses the benefit of Christ, making those who were far off now partakers of the mystery of the gospel. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13, 14. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the, the dividing wall. And in John's gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us that his people, his disciples, will be distinguished by their love for one another. And then in Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17, he prays for their unity, that they would be one even as he and the Father are one. And he says this three times in John 17, verse 11, John 17, verse 21, and in John 17, verse 22. Jesus' prayer for his people is that they would be unified. So what was so important in Corinth that they're dividing? Food, appetites, self-promotion, self-identification and status, the rich, the poor, the thing that so often pierces with grief, the love of money, the practice of making distinctions, becoming judges with evil motives based on appearances. This is what was ripping apart the congregation at Corinth. What made all of this so awful was that this was taking place, especially at a time when they ought to have been celebrating Christ rather than promoting self. One pastor has this to say on the text. A Christian's attitude and motives should be pure at all times, but when believers come to the table of the Lord, sharing the bread of his body and the cup of his blood, it is absolutely necessary that they leave behind all sin, all bitterness, all racial prejudice, all class pride, and all feelings of superiority. Of all places and occasions, these attitudes are most out of place at the Lord's Supper. 
they grievously profane that holy, beautiful, beautiful and unifying ordinance of God. But what about us? Because there's an element here where we would look and we'd be like, yeah, yeah, man, those, those Corinthians, they were messed up. Just, just read the book. Read through and find out, man, they were, they were way off target here, weren't they? There was other stuff happening. You, you don't have to get very far into the letter to the Corinthians to say, man, there's a lot of things going wrong. That's not us, though. We don't have their problems. But it matters, beloved, so that we do not make the same mistake. Not just in regard to the Lord's table, but at all times. The Lord's Supper functions as a marker, as a reminder or a checkpoint to stop and examine our practices, to examine our patterns and behaviors and to see where we're drifting off, where we're becoming lax, where sin has gained a toehold, and to put those things to death. Don't believe for a moment that the situation in Corinth happened all at once. What was taking place, what Paul heard about it, what, it wasn't just, man, one day people showed up and everything fell apart. It did not happen all at once. It may have been realized all at once. Maybe there was an especially heinous gathering of one of these feasts that made some of the believers say, man, the Apostle Paul needs to hear about this one. But it began long before that. It began in the heart of a few, maybe even just one believer, who became unchecked, who came unchecked to the table of the Lord with a sense of superiority and self-centeredness. And it devolved into drunkenness and gluttony at the expense of the other members of the body in the name of Christ. Listen, how do you know that? Well, because this isn't the first time unity is dealt with in this book. There were divisions everywhere. And what's at the root of these divisions? You journey across the pages of Scripture. Where does that come from? For those of you who have been part of any kind of discipling here at CBC, you, you know the answer is probably going to be pride. And you're right. It, it comes from this self-focus, this self-promotion of this is about me and what I want above all else. And we foolishly believe, but that's, I just want it in this area. It would never get to this degree that we're reading about here in Corinth. <coughs> well, sin is never far removed. But we need to take seriously the warnings of Scripture. Take heed, you who think you stand, lest you fall. If we think, man, we're just doing so well, there's no sin to guard against, we'd better look out. Don't think to yourself, we could never drift that far from the mark. Why not? I want you to consider that question. As we're going to be considering what, what are the tools the Lord has given for fighting sin, pursuing holiness, what keeps us from drifting into the heinous, ugly, D despicable circumstances that we read about in places like Corinth. What keeps us from that? What restrains us? If we're not putting sin to death regularly, being challenged to examine, keep a short receipt, to repent often and thoroughly, where does the restraint come from? If our minds and our hearts, our affections are not being pointed back to the Lord. It's a foolish man that says, I would never sin in that way. And then goes on carelessly toying with sin. That's one thing the Lord's table does when observed rightly. It challenges us to approach with reverence and fear and hope and repentance and joy. That's what we're going to see next as we move into the next section here of Paul's rebuke to the Corinthians. Look with me beginning in verse 25. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. First, Paul's reminding them, this ordinance, this grace from the Lord is just that. It's from the Lord. As I mentioned already, we don't observe the Lord's table as a stodgy old tradition. We do it because the living Savior and King has commanded it. Beloved, 
that should change the attitude that we approach the Lord's table. That should change our attitude towards us, to, towards this practice, that we would regard it with the reverence of our king has commanded, therefore we obey. We have been given the privilege of partaking. We've been given access to this. We have been given this command to follow, and it is our duty and our joy to obey. And we do it specifically, as he told us, with the elements that he has prescribed in the manner that he has commanded because of what it communicates. Listen to verse 26. Again, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Listen, there's a whole lot in these verses that we're just not going to get into this morning. But I would direct us to this verse in particular so that we understand what's being presented, what's being pictured or portrayed and proclaimed in the Lord's table. Distinctly, specifically, it's declaring the death of Christ. It's the suffering that we just remembered on Good Friday. Why? Why would there be this specific command of, hey, take notice of this, look at this, remember this frequently. As often as you do, do this, remember. Well, because of what it demands of us. It demands so many things, not the least of which is that we have to grapple with why Christ had to die. When we come to the Lord's table, we're being visited afresh with the reminder of, he, he died. Do you remember why? The Son of God, God himself, had to take on flesh. Why? Why did he have to do that? Why did he have to die? That's one of those fundamental questions. If you've got little ones and you're giving them the gospel, you're communicating the truth to them, they're hearing this in the children's ministry. They're hearing Jesus Christ died, and the question inevitably arises, well, why? Why did it have to be that way? Not just why was that the mode that the Lord chose, but specifically, why did he have to die? And all of a sudden it gets real personal, real quick. He had to die to bring us to life. He had to die to suffer for our sin. He had to die to bring us to God. He had to die so that we would be free from the penalty and the bondage to sin. He had to die because we deserve to die. He died because we are sinners. And his death is the hope of freedom from the penalty of sin. His death is the only solution to wash us white as snow, though our sins be as scarlet. His death is the propitiation for our sin. That means... It's by his death that we're reconciled to God. His death is the power of God to redeem our souls and pardon our transgressions, heal our enmity with the almighty creator and bring us to him. And his death is proclaimed in the table. His death is proclaimed in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the vine. His death is proclaimed. And as verse 26 points out to us though, his death is proclaimed for a specific time. Did you notice the words at the end of verse 26? Until he comes. He's coming again, beloved. He's returning for his people. He's returning to establish his kingdom over all and rule with a rod of iron to break the nations, crush the rebels, and comfort his people. He's returning to bring us to where he is. He's returning to end this age. He's coming. And then he'll sit down with his bride and drink once more of the cup. Do you remember that? In that last scene, as the Lord is with his followers, he says, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine again until I come again in the establishment of the kingdom. Like the old song used to say, there's a great day a coming. At that time, it's no longer in anticipation, but in glorious celebration. The Lord's table looks backward at the cross, but beloved, it also looks forward. It looks upward, and it looks ahead. It looks to the great and blessed hope of the promise that in the same way in which his disciples saw him go, he shall most certainly come again. Do we take the cup this way? Do we take the bread this way, with this in our mind? Do we receive the elements and consider one day? One day we'll feast in heaven. Though we mourn for a moment, though we weep at the present, one day there will be no more sorrow but only singing. There will be no more sinning, only rejoicing and freedom and hope fulfilled. 
So we come to the table, do you look only at your sinfulness? Yes, look, see it. See vile, filthy, shameful, the mark that we deserve, the mocking voice, the cursing mouth. See it and the curse laid on him. Willingly he comes under and bears the wrath of God for my sin and yours. He bears the weight and is crushed beneath the Father that I may be brought in. Do you see the hope? The Father was pleased to do this, that we might be called the sons of God. He did this according to his excellent mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. Do we take the cup and the bread like this? That's what's being proclaimed. That's what's being <clears throat> portrayed in those little plates. Listen to me, those clanging signs, those crude little cups, the broken bread and cracked little pieces. It's all a little image of the glorious reality of our Savior broken and poured out on our behalf. It's the glory of God on display in weak and small things. It's the gospel in a thimble-sized cup and a broken cracker. Even in this, we're reminded of how our God works. He takes the broken, despised, lowly, unlovely, simple, common things of this world and places the light of the gospel within them and triumphs over the darkness. Do we take the cup and the bread this way? When we come to the table, when, when we have the elements passed, do we, do we have that reverence? And we play the quiet music and we all sit quiet and we try to keep still and we, we don't try to look around and we don't try to, you know, fidget too much. But do we discipline our minds to see the glory of the gospel on display? His power. And these little vessels... That's why we're called to remember in verses 24 and 25. You see that, don't you? When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant, my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This cup and bread of remembrance, this work of remembrance, it, it takes work. It's more than recall. It's, it's deeper and better than that. It's deeper than just like, yeah, yeah, that, that happened. As a historic reference. In fact, this word is only found about four times in the New Testament. It's found here, these two places. It's found once in the record that's being quoted from Luke. And it's found once more in the book of Hebrews. In each of those instances, it's... More than just, hey, remember that that happened. As one writer put it, remembrance in this sense is not just memory, but active, obedient participation in the living out of the cross-shaped story of Jesus. This eating is more than a historic memorial or consumption of food. For Paul, it's an eschatological proclamation of the gospel that shapes all reality, both now and in the future. Because of what's proclaimed, we have to think well on it. Charles Hodges says in this text, those who come to the Lord's table therefore should come not to satisfy hunger, nor for the gratification of social feelings, but for the definite purpose of bearing their testimony to the great fact of redemption and to co contribute their portion of influence to the preservation and propagation of the knowledge of that fact. And listen, you just thought you were coming to church. That's what's taking place. It's, it's one of the wonderful things that gets to happen, especially if you, has, if you have little ones in the service with you. Then we talk about, hey, we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper tonight. And inevitably around, you know, four or five, when they're a little bit more aware of what's happening, they're sitting in the service and they're saying, hey, can I? Because normally, when, when do we say no to juice? But all of a sudden it's, no, 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 you don't touch that one. You don't get to have this one. Not yet. But why? Beloved, you've just been delivered a golden gospel conversation, a golden gospel opportunity. Let me tell you. 
It's like a New Testament version of what mean you by these stones next to the Jordan River. Oh, let me tell you about it. But here's the deal. We, we can limit ourselves to thinking, yeah, it's great for the kids. No, but how about this? I can't make it this evening. We're taking communion. I'm not going to be there. I have to leave by this time because we're taking the Lord's table. What is that? What's the big deal? Didn't you guys do that just a few weeks ago? Did you do that last month? What, why do you do that? Gospel opportunity. Let's proclaim. Let's talk. How was your day yesterday? What did you do? Getting through the weekend. Back to work on Monday. Let me tell you. We proclaim the gospel. How? What, did you, what do you mean? What does that look like? We took the Lord's table. We took the Lord's supper. But because that's the weight of what we're doing, there's very certainly a right way and a wrong way to do it. And that's where the Apostle Paul issues the warning of the next several verses. Beginning in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself. And in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world. <clears throat> a few things to take notice of here. First of all, probably most obviously, there is a worthy and an unworthy way of taking the Lord's Supper. Uh, again, do we think well about these things? Do we consider them? Do we approach this momentous time as the church gathered, as the body gathered and say, uh, I need to do some work of preparation? We often will announce beforehand. We'll often put out the word. We'll, we'll in the services prior, like you heard this morning, we'll, we'll say, we're going to be taking the Lord's table tonight. We're going to be observing the Lord's Supper. Be prepared for that. That doesn't just mean make, make sure you're here. That doesn't just mean put it on the calendar. That doesn't just mean, hey, we want to let you know what's going on. There's a lot more happening. We're calling attention to exactly what's just been laid out. There is an unworthy and a worthy way in which to partake. And Paul doesn't leave us guessing. He spells it out for us in verse 28. A man must examine himself. That's the worthy way. To do it unworthily, verse 29 tells us, is to not judge the body rightly. Some of your translations may have that as without or, or not discerning the body. This word that's translated discern or, or judge, it, it's a little difficult to render in this context. It's got a lot of different ways that it can be translated, but at its base level, it, it just means to decide between. In fact, earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 5, that's how it's translated in reference to arbitrating disputes between brothers, to judge or decide between them. Later on in chapter 14, verse 29, it's translated as passing judgment on one another. I think most appropriately here, in, in light of the context of the preceding verses, it's best to understand this unworthy approach of not discerning, judging, or evaluating the body as approaching the entire event of the Lord's table without proper or due esteem. It's approaching it with this flippancy, this casualness. It's not seeing the people of God for who they are, not seeing the table for what it is. And most significantly and underlying all of this, it's not evaluating Christ and his sacrifice rightly. This would most definitely involve approaching with unrepentant sin. It's one of the reasons we talk about this is in preparation, do heart work. Do heart work. Be prepared to examine it. Am I clinging on to any kind of sin that I'm saying I, I don't want to let go of it? I don't want it uncovered. I don't want it forsaken. I, I want the benefit and the blessing of redemption. I want deliverance. I want salvation. I, I want those things that come with knowing Christ, but I don't want to give this up. That's an unworthy way because you're saying, I, I, I don't esteem him 
and the things that he died to free me from, I esteem them more highly than obedience to him. This would be to approach the table, even in a perfunctory, ritual kind of way. To come with sinful attitudes. To be like the Corinthians, to look around as we have the Lord's table and begin to disobey the commands of, are we esteeming one another as more highly than ourselves? Are we evaluating the Lord's body rightly? It would be to see the proclamation of the gospel in the Lord's table as not a big deal. I'm here. I'm doing the thing. I always do the thing. I show up. I, I go through the motions. I nod to the corner. I come in. I take the stuff. I know the rule. I know when to stand. I know when to sit. I even know to quiet down when the countdown gets to zero. I know all the steps. But my heart's not in it. Beloved, that's an unworthy way. It dishonors our Lord. It dishonors the memorial of his sacrifice. It dishonors his people. One of the reasons I believe it reaches into this area, not just viewing the body rightly, not just the way that we're interacting with one another, is because of what Paul says in verse 31 and 32. If we judged, same word as verse 29, ourselves, we would not be judged. Actually, a different word. The second word translated judge here is along the lines of being sentenced or receiving a, 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 a judgment. It's the same word that's used at the beginning of verse 32. But when we are judged or sentenced, we're disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned, whole other word, along with the world. This word condemned is yet another word group. It's related to the first two. But verse 32 helps us understand what's happening here. Paul saying if we would discern or evaluate ourselves rightly in light of the rest of the body, the weightiness of the Lord's table, we would not be sentenced. What's this sentencing? Well, it looks like discipline, verse 32. It looks like if, if we would do this work, if we would approach it rightly, if we would have this righteous view of the Lord's table, then we would not expect discipline which is not the same as condemnation. If we receive discipline, Paul says, it's so that we escape condemnation. All of this is to say an unworthy partaking of the table will result in discipline by the Lord for the believer. Unless we think that's no big deal. Look back with me at verse 30. For this reason... Because so many were partaking unworthily. Many among you are weak and sick. And a number sleep. As one commentator said, spiritual ills may have physical results. In other words, they were experiencing a physical form of discipline from the Lord. Even to the point of death. That idea of sleep is euphemistic for death. They were being disciplined, being brought all the way to the point of their physical life ending because of their dishonoring of the Lord's table. Now, lest we sit back and think, the Lord doesn't do that kind of stuff anymore. Do, do we despise the grace of the Lord, first of all? There is that sort of, when we read the account in Acts of Ananias and Sapphira, we read about... Uh, uh, the, the sons of Levi. We, le we read about the sons of Eli in, in 1 Samuel. We read about Uzzah. We read about all these characters through the Old Testament. We think, man, I'm just really glad God doesn't do that now. 1 Corinthians might ring our bell a little bit and say, are we sure? Because we understand discipline as the Lord's children is a good thing to retrieve us from sin. To retrieve us from walking in a way that is dishonoring and disobedient to him. 
And do we so presume on the grace of God to say, he, he did that then, but, you know, lots of stuff in 1 Corinthians. It doesn't continue today. So I, I can just assume that the Lord won't do that to me. I can approach the table however I please. Beware. We must cultivate a fear of the Lord. We must cultivate a fear of the Lord that says, he means it. He means it, beloved. Even that being brought to the point of death was a form of loving discipline. One pastor put it this way, even if the Lord were to strike us dead for profaning his table, it would be to discipline us, to keep us from being condemned. And that is a powerful thought. That we would consider the Lord would bring us to a point of, I'm going to stop you so you don't anymore. Dishonor my name, dishonor my people. And uniformly across the pages of Scripture, when the Lord does something like that, what's the response of the people of God? Does their fear of Him go up or go down? It goes up exponentially. The Lord receives glory in that. And what is the Lord all about? His name being honored. But we must take heed. I want to be quick to point something out here. This is not saying, if you feel unworthy, don't partake. That's not what this is talking about. Can I tell you something? Only those who feel their unworthiness ought to come. As we sing in one of the songs, Come ye sinners, all the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. Calvin here is so helpful. He writes about this text. It's not a perfect faith or repentance that's required as some by urging beyond due bounds to a perfection that can't, can't be found anywhere. If, however, you aspire after the righteousness of God with the earnest desire of your mind and humbled under the view of your misery, lean wholly upon Christ's grace and rest upon it. Know that you are a worthy guest to approach that table. Worthy and that the Lord does not exclude you. For faith, when it is but begun, makes those worthy who were unworthy. In other words, saying, as you see your sinfulness rightly, and you look at the grace of God on display, portrayed, represented through the cup and the bread, this is where you hope in Christ. This is where you rest on him and lean in him. Not with this fixed view of your sinfulness, but with a view to his adequacy. Yes. Come in faith, beloved. He supplies your need. Your faith is small, it's weak. Take the bread, drink the cup. Feed your faith. Leaning wholly on Jesus as your acceptance, trusting in his sacrifice, portrayed in the elements as your peace with God. Worthy? Not on your own. No. None of us are. Worthy by the name of the one who loved you and gave himself for you. Paul concludes this section with such an eminently practical conclusion. It begins in verses 33 and 34. He essentially says, stop it. Verse 33, so then my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. It's amazing, really, that the context of what's given here. Beginning back in first, verse 17, Paul is addressing, there's this ridiculously sinful, dishonoring thing that's taking place. From there, we turn the lens to take in the glory and the weight, the beauty, the majesty of what has been provided for us in the table of the Lord. And then Paul says, with all of that as the foundation, don't you think you can fix this? 
Don't you think you can stop with the neglect of the poor among you, with the self-promotion, with the selfishness, with all of the self-centeredness that had so polluted what was supposed to be about remembering the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ? With that in view, wait for one another. Consider one another. And anything else, we'll fix that when I come. In other words, for all the amazing depth and beauty and weight of this section, and the dirt and grind of the practical, live in light of the table. Be fed by it. Be changed by your observance of it. Fight your sin in light of the beauty of the grace of the gospel presented and proclaimed in the practice of the supper. In other words, it's as, it's as if Paul is saying, with all of that, now you know how to do it. Now you know how to repent in preparation for it. Now you know how to partake of it, be fed by it, be, be ministered to in it, so that as you go to do it, you'll do it well. This is one of the things that I think can so easily turn us a little bit aside. Is that we can so often be caught up in, in, in the glory and the beauty of what the Lord has provided for us. And, and just in the appreciation of the knowledge of it, but not in the practice of it. That we can see these things. We can marvel at the wonder of God and his glory in the story of Jonah. And not do anything with it. That we can see these things, we can be apprehended by them, at least in our minds, to where we would look and we would say, this is fantastic. I've never thought about the Lord's table this way. I've never really considered this is the weight of it. But then, do we do anything? Do we follow through in practice? There's warnings across the pages of Scripture, knowledge puffs up. There's warnings across the pages of Scripture, you... you must be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. We don't want a speculative head knowledge of as we approach this evening and take our seats and are brought to the Lord's Supper. We don't want to just sit there and be like, yeah, you know, there's some stuff I never thought of this morning. And do no hard work. Well, that's a dangerous place to be. It's dangerous for so many reasons, not the least of which is that we will give an account. We will give an account for the deeds under the body. We will give an account for the things that we know and have been made known to us. So in these areas, as we consider and prepare for this evening, as we prepare to partake of these things, this gracious feast from our Lord, We must do the work. Just a few exhortations to help us prepare. One pastor wrote, before taking part in such a service, the very least we can do is conduct rigorous self-examination. The very least that we can do is conduct rigorous self-examination. That means that we ought to labor to come with a clean conscience. We ought to labor to come, even, even as our Lord has given instruction, we have one another and we ought to go to one another where we see each other in sin. We ought to go to one another if we have something against one another. It's vital. It's necessary. It's unifying. It's glorifying to our God. That we would do that labor of self-examination, that we would do that examination that is not just a, hey, how am I doing? But also, am I viewing this rightly? Do I esteem the body of Christ in the way that I ought to? Does it hold the place in my life that the Lord has commanded it be held? Do I view him and his work on the cross with weight? and beauty, and glory. 
Do I view it as mine, for me? Do, do I recognize and confess he died because of my sin? And so like the preparation, it's remembrance for the participation. Another Puritan, John Flavel, said, remembrance properly is the return of the mind to something that we were familiar, or familiar with previously, either speculatively for a moment or affectionately and permanently. An affectionate remembrance is when we so call Christ and his death to our minds as to feel the powerful impressions thereof upon our hearts. <laughs> Beloved, when you call to mind the Lord Jesus Christ and his work, does it affect your heart? Does it affect your affections? Does it stir in you a great love for him? One of the things about doing something in remembrance is you have to have something to remember. There has to be something that you are looking back upon and saying, no, 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 that, that work, that work on the cross, I, I, I know it, I'm familiar with it. I know how it relates to me and how I relate to it. It brought me to life through his death. In his life, I was raised with him. So it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. If, as we consider the cross, there is not that remembrance, if there is not that, yeah, I mean, I know it. I know the story. One of the elements Pastor Philip and I were talking about this past week was the, the incredible level of the broken sinfulness of man's heart that's on display when you read through the accounts of the resurrection. That there were those who were so intimately acquainted with the reality of the resurrection. They knew it happened and could not deny it that they had to pay others to concoct another story. The religious leader said, soldiers, we're going to give you money if you, will, if you will spread out this lie that somebody came and took the body. Okay? They were so aware that that's not the case. They paid other people to spread the story, and yet they did not believe. Beloved, it's not enough to know the facts. It's not enough to know the details of the story. It's not enough to come and say, I, I, I know what the bread represents. I know what the cup represents. I, I know what these things are. It, it's something else entirely to say, it's for me. Amen. It's mine. And I am his by grace through faith. I am a participant. John Owen, picking up this thread, encourages, remember in particular the love Jesus Christ as the God-man had in giving himself for us. One of the works that this does in us is that not only does it bring us to a place of readiness for repentance and preparation, and then in remembrance and rejoicing in the moment as we partake and we're ministered to, our faith is fed. But even as we move out from there, with that as the landmark, with that as the, the, the mark, marker place in our life of saying, yes, I, I have dealt well with the sins that I know I have been entangled with. I have labored to lay them aside. I have labored to repent of them. And now moving forward, I am ready to continue pressing on. Oh, but that's what the table is for. We repent, we remember, we repent. We repent, we remember, we repent. And we continue on doing the things that we're supposed to do. And we do so by faith, and we do so with a glorious hope, never forgetting. Because in the grind and in the repetition of all of this, there's a... There's a place that our hearts can so easily drift into when we go just, again, I've had to repent a lot recently. I've really struggled, and I have not even struggled well in some of these areas. And here we come again to the Lord's table, to which I would point us back to those blessed words of verse 26, until he comes. Beloved, there is an end date 
There is a final marker. Now, I want you to think on this for just a second. One day, there will be a last Lord's Supper service. Amen. Have we thought of that? There'll be one for each of us if the Lord tarries. There'll be one for each of us where that will be the last time. But in this age, one day, whether in our lifetime or in a dozen lifetimes from now, one day there will be the last and the Lord will return triumphant. And beloved, we have to remember this. Again, not just calling to mind, but it affecting our affections. When we partake of the table, are we looking in hope for that day? Are we looking in hope, remembering, recognizing, confessing, and one day, one day we won't do this anymore. One day will be the last. And, and one day, this faith will be made sight. One day, the veil will be removed. One day he returns. And what does scripture again and again and again point us to as we look for and hasten that day? What manner of lives ought we to live in all holiness and godliness? Beloved, the Lord's table is for our sanctification. It's for our fight against sin. It's for our holiness. We repent, we remember, and we are fed at the table of the Lord. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you have so graciously provided for us all the means necessary through your spirit, through your people, through your word, through your ordinances. Lord, you have provided that which we need to have our affections continually stirred up on you. Lord, we ask that as a church we would labor diligently to be those who hold this practice, this treasure, this command, this duty well. That we would do so worthily. That we would do so with a right heart, a right attitude. We would do so to glorify your name in unity. And we would do so in celebration of your perfect provision. And we thank you and we praise your name. In the name of your son. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as we